What are shutter and shutter speed in photography? Hi and welcome to episode 155, no less, of the Photography Explained podcast. I'm your host Rick and in each episode I will try to explain one photographic thing to you in plain English in less than 27 minutes-ish without the irrelevant details. Still saying ish, what I tell you is based on my lifetime of photographic experience and not Google. Okay, there was some Google research in this one, and for that I say, thank you Google. Yep, I still have to do research, even now, on something as basic as the shutter, but it's fine because it gives me a complete answer, which is good. Okay, first here is the answer bit. The shutter in a camera is the thing that moves when the shutter release button is pressed, exposing the camera sensor to light. Shutter speed is the amount of time that the camera sensor is exposed to light. The shutter speed can be changed to allow more or less light to reach the sensor, getting a correct exposure in combination with the aperture and ISO. Fast shutter speeds freeze the action and capture fast moving things, and are also used in bright lighting conditions. Slow shutter speeds can create movement and blur in photos, and are also used in low light conditions. Finally, when taking photos handheld, the shutter speed needs to be fast enough to prevent camera shake and ensure that you get a sharp image every time. Right, well that was my answer. Um, Quite a long answer, but a very good answer if I do say so myself. Yeah, this is one of those rare things in photography that pretty much makes sense. Having covered the aperture in the last episode, which it's not the easiest thing to cover properly. I mean, it's not complicated. It's just, it's not easy to describe, is it? So I've been looking forward to this one because shutter in shutter speed, yeah, they're just logical things. So let's embrace this because the next one's, well, quite dull. But before I go on, if you've got a question you'd like me to answer, just go to photographyexplainpodcast.com forward slash start. Okay then, so why the term shutter? Well, (laughs) why not? What's the shutter anyway? There are many definitions of what a shutter is, most of which relate to things that you close to stop light from getting through a window. I didn't say that in my script, but things that you open to let light in through a window. <laughs> and, the, and these are normally in pairs. And, and there's every chance that there are two shutters in your camera. And no, I did not know that. I say I didn't know it. I, I, was surprised that, I was surprised that there were two shutters, but I thought I knew that. But oh, it doesn't matter, does it? Shut up, Rick. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? Shutter is a term. That's what the shutter's doing in a camera, isn't it? Sort of, anyway. I mean, shutters appeared in photography back in the 1800s at the time when handheld cameras and indeed camera film were both being developed, no pun intended. Don't worry, that's the history lesson over. That's enough for me. We don't need to know any more. If you do, great, off you go. Don't need to let me know, though, because I'm happy with that. So how does the shutter work? Well... When we had film SLR cameras, you press the shutter button. Now, I've been using shutter release button, but a lot of things say shutter button, so I'm going to go with that because it's, well, it's shorter, isn't it? So when we had film SLR cameras, you press the shutter button and the mirror flipped up and the shutter opened, exposing the camera film to light. The amount of time the shutter was open determined the exposure time. And when SLRs went digital, so SLR became DSLR, genius, I know, The same thing happened, but instead of film, there was a sensor in its place. But the same thing happened. The mirror flipped up and all that good stuff. Now, with mirrorless cameras, things have moved on. Mirrorless cameras, well, they don't have a mirror. Again, I think people coming into photography now, when when you say mirrorless camera, they're sort of looking at you going, well, I didn't expect it to have a mirror anyway, so I think we need to change that term to, um, how about camera? So mirrorless cameras, they have electronic shutters as well as mechanical shutters. So things have evolved, but the principle still applies. And with mirrorless cameras, the sensor is exposed to light until you take a photo when the shutter comes into action. So that's a big difference. Obviously, camera film was sensitive to light, so that had to be protected from the light by the shutter. And with the mirrorless camera, the shutter closes and then opens and... Oh, (laughs) And with mirrorless cameras, the sensor is exposed to light until you take a photo when the shutter comes into action. Now, I was trying to say then, when you press the shutter button with the mirrorless camera, the shutter closes and then opens. But I think I'm getting confused. I'm going to stop there. So, yeah, evolution, but either way, the principle is the same. The shutter controls the amount of time that the camera sensor is exposed to light, controlling how much light gets through to the camera sensor. 
What's the shutter made of? Well, well, simple question you would have thought. Now, in the past, I've asked Canon, Sony and Olympus. I've asked each of them and none of them would tell me. I mean, maybe I should ask them again. It was a couple of years ago, but they didn't want to tell me. I'm pretty sure that they used to be made of metal and it looks like metal on my Canon 6D. And they might still be made of metal, but then again, there are probably some more modern shutters in newer digital cameras made of other, more advanced materials. But if I'm being brutally honest, it's not that important, is it? What is important, how long does a shutter last? Most cameras have a mechanical shutter, as in, yep, the thing that moves. Made of whatever. You can also get an electronic shutter, but that's like an on-off switch, that's different. But either way, a shutter exposes the camera to sense light. I've said that before, haven't I? But there is something called a shutter count. See, every camera has a shutter-rated lifespan. Now, how many times has my shutter been used on my Canon 6D? I've got no idea. And to find that out, I'd need to do some work and I'd have to buy some fancy plug in type thing. But do you know what? I'm not going to bother. What I can tell you is that in Lightroom I've got 23,000 photos taken with my Canon 6D. See, I'm fortunate I don't take that many photos, so I take as few photos as I can. So if I was being conservative and double that, my camera's taken 46,000 photos. So 100,000 to go, which the way I'm going, that's another 30 years. So I think I'm okay for now. And I think I might replace my camera within 30 years. It's been going for quite a few now. But this shutter lifespan is only a guide, and if a shutter fails, you can get it replaced, of course. Now, for mirrorless cameras with an electronic shutter, well, I thought the lifespan would be infinite, but it doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, my Olympus AM5, it's got 100,000 shutter actuation rating. Oh, well. So I did a bit of research. I'd have never known this off the top of my head. The Sony a7 III has got a shutter lifespan of 200,000 actuations. And the Canon EOS R also has a rating of 200,000 shutter actuations. So it would appear that shutter lifespan is pretty much comparable between DSLR cameras and mirrorless cameras. And you could also assume that the more money you pay and the higher the standard and quality of a camera, the longer the shutter lifespan will be. I think I've said enough about that, haven't I? Let's move on. Okay, anything else on the shutter itself? Well, <laughs> I don't know. And then I wrote, yes, what actually happens? Now, when you press, this is the thing that I often forget to tell you the absolutely blindingly obvious bit, which sometimes I need to do like now. So this is what happens. When you press the shutter button, the shutter opens, exposing the camera sensor to light. And because of the really fast shutter speed times, such as 1,000, one, <laughs> that's a, <laughs> I failed on that, didn't I? Because of the really fast shutter speed times, such as one four thousandth of a second. The reason I was struggling was my Canon 6D can do that, and that's donkey's years old now. Now, one four thousandth of a second, it's, it's too short a time to comprehend, isn't it? But I could tell you this, the shutter cannot open and close fast enough. And that's why there's a second shutter which closes, ending the exposure. And no, this was the thing I didn't know. So... As one shutter's opening, the other one's coming down. It's it's really clever. I've never, I don't think I've thought about this one too much. I've just taken it as read that the shutter opens and closes, but never given any great thought to what one four thousandth of a second actually. Well, I know what it looks like and sounds like, but how it physically works, if you know what I mean. And then there's electronic shutters, and like I've said before, that's like turning a light on and then off. So mechanical and electronic shutters, they do the same thing, but in different ways, and. That's all I need to say about electronic shutters, to be honest with you, because the principle is open... Well, I've told you that already. I don't need to... I must stop repeating myself. Right, shutter speed range. This is the important bit, the shutter speed range. This is the length of time that the shutter is open, exposing the camera sensor to light. Yeah, the, the taking the photo bit, the good stuff. So here is the shutter speed range, which probably is as dull as the aperture range was in the last episode. Aperture scale, sorry. Brace yourselves. 30 seconds, 15 seconds, 8 seconds. Oh, I'm just going to say 4, 2, 1, half, quarter, 8th, 15th, 30th, 60th, 125th, 250th, 500th, 1000th, 1 2000th, and 1 4000th. 
and one eight thousandth, and I'll stop there because there will be faster speeds than that, but I ain't got them. And yeah, I had to type this lot out. <laughs> so that's it. You can select whatever shutter speed you want with most cameras, and the shutter speed will vary. Sorry, the shutter speed range will vary from camera to camera. And I've always wondered when you go from an eighth of a second to a fifteenth, that should be sixteenth, shouldn't it? Does that matter? And then you go from one. Oh no, you don't do that again, do you? Move on. Sorry. This is what happens when I ad lib. It's a dangerous thing. So my Canon 6D, it gives me 30 seconds to one four thousandth of a second. And that's more than enough for me. And each of those changes of shutter speed that I listed, that, that equates to one stop. Now, one stop, <laughs> what does that mean? Change the shutter speed from one 125th of a second to one 250th of a second. And you are exposing the camera sensor to light for half as long, which is a halving of the amount of light getting through to the camera sensor. And that is one stop. Change the shutter speed from one one thousandth of a second to one five hundredth of a second. And you are exposing the camera sensor to to light for twice as long, which is a doubling of the amount of light getting through to the camera sensor. And this is also one stop. So what's a stop? Well, a stop is a halving or a doubling of the amount of light. And if you combine this with changes in the aperture, which I went through in the last episode, this is how you can get the correct exposure with different camera settings. And I'm going to come on to this in the episode about exposure. And then I remembered, now I'd written in episode 153, not that long ago, what is exposure in photography? A beginner's guide. I need to listen to that, don't I? And also in episode 154, how do I get the correct exposure every time I take a photo? See, I'd, ne- <laughs> I'd nearly forgotten about, well, not nearly, I'd forgotten about these. And even worse, I'd forgotten the fact that in these episodes, I was going to tell you about the shutter in this episode. So I covered exposure and getting the correct exposure. And in those episodes, as I said, and in future episodes, I'm going to cover aperture, shutter and ISO. Here I am now. Oh, well, it's been a long year. It's only June, that's a worry. So let's talk about why we have different shutter speeds then. Yeah, well, why not, Rick? Why not? Indeed. First off, handheld shooting. The shutter opens and lets light through to the camera sensor. Now, if you move the camera when you're taking a photo, there's every chance you can get a blurry photo. And if you move the camera faster than the shutter is open, I think that's right, isn't it? If you move the camera quicker than the shutter, you're going to get a blurry photo. And that's why you need to stand nice and still when you take a photo and choose a fast enough shutter speed. But what is a fast enough shutter speed? Well, there's a rule of thumb here and it's a good one. With good technique, as in standing, actually, if you go back to one of the very early episodes, I do cover how to take a photo. I'm going to revisit that, I think, because that was a good one. That's another of those things that It sounds obvious, but if you haven't been told it, you won't know it. Basically, you stand still in the correct position and you breathe nice and slow, press the shutter button gently. And if you do all of that stuff, using a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second or faster, you should be fine. But if you're using a longer focal length, your shutter speed needs to be, wait for it, the reciprocal of the focal length. I know, I'm sorry. It's not as bad as it sounds, though. Let me explain it. If you're using a 200mm focal length, your shutter speed needs to be faster than the reciprocal of the focal length, which is 1 over 200, which gives you a shutter speed of 1 250th of a second. See? Sorted. And that's the starting point for shutter speed, choosing a fast enough shutter speed to get sharp photos while still getting the exposure right, and this is where aperture and ISO come into play. Now, there's things called image stabilisation, which give you lots more latitude, but I'm not covering those here. They're going to be in a in a special... <laughs> They're not going to be in a special episode at all. I just remembered and not put them on my list. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> right, get a grip. Fast shutter speed. Not surprisingly, a fast shutter speed exposes the camera sensor to light for less time, meaning that you can capture a moving object without any blur. A very fast shutter speed will freeze most things. And if you use a fast shutter speed, you've got less chance of getting camera shake and getting a blurry photo. So things to remember. So longer shutter speed, well, even less surprisingly, 
using a slower shutter speed allows you to get motion blur in a photo. Your camera has to be still, of course, so you need a tripod or other device. Low light. In low light conditions, you'll probably need a slower shutter speed to get the correct exposure. And if it's too dark, you'll need to put your camera on a tripod again and do other stuff to get a sharp photo. Alternatively, you can use a larger aperture to let more light in or a faster ISO or add light to the scene using a flash or similar device. Right, bright light. Well, in bright lighting conditions, you, you'll probably need a faster shutter speed to get the correct exposure. And then again, you can use a smaller aperture or a lower ISO value or reduce the amount of light using a filter. Quick word on filters, ND filters. If you need to reduce the amount of light getting through to the camera sensor, you can get something called a neutral density filter. And this reduces the amount of light. Now, sunglasses for cameras are once called ND filters. I know, I know. <laughs> And I've got a neutral density filter that gives me a whopping 10 stop reduction in light, which that's 10 doublings of the light or sorry, it's 10 halvings. It's, <laughs> that's 10 halvings of the amount of light, which I'm not sure what number that gets you to. And it doesn't matter. ND filters are popular amongst landscape photographers, but they can be used by anybody who just wants to reduce the amount of light gets through to the image sensor or wants to reduce the camera shutter speed. So, yeah, the combination of aperture and shutter and, and the lighting conditions. Yeah, if it's brighter, you can use a faster shutter speed, but it depends on the aperture. So you look at the two together. But the thing I want to say here is that you change the aperture and the shutter speed to get the correct exposure before you change the ISO. Ideally, you start with the low ISO and you keep it like that. But if you needed to, if you if the light wasn't bright enough to get a, a, a sharp photo handheld, then you'd increase the ISO after you'd done things with the aperture as well. But I'll come back to ISO in the next episode, and then we'll talk about exposure. So we'll come, I'll pick up all that good stuff then. So let's let's get back to shutter, bulb mode. Well, bulb mode B on on the control dial on a Canon 6D. So what's this then? Well, using bulb, you can use as long a shutter speed as you want. Now, we used to have a good old cable release for this back in the day, as you had to keep the shutter button pressed down for the whole length of the exposure. Now, these days, we've got apps and wireless remote releases and all that good stuff to help us do this, but the principle is the same. You press the shutter button, which opens the shutter, and you hold it for whatever, a minute, and then you let go again. Obviously, a cable releases you, so you're not touching the camera and moving it, although you get less less issues when, when you're doing such long exposures and you'd also definitely be on a tripod for these. So just picking up on a couple of things I said there, if you combine the bulb mode with an ND filter, this, this opens up a whole new world of ultra-long exposure photography. And using long exposures, you can, you can create some really good and really striking and different stuff. And it's one of those things I love doing. I, I should do more of it. Right, my next headline is other complicated stuff. <laughs> there is some other stuff, but I'm not going to bother with that. That's going to take you and me down the unwanted coolie site called Irrelevant Detail, and I'm not going there. If you want to know what the other complicated stuff is, just drop me a line and I'll tell you. How aperture and ISO relate to shutter speed? Well, that's the exposure triangle, and I've mentioned two other episodes about exposure and I'm going to I'm going to come back to exposure triangle after the next episode all about ISO because it's such an important and fundamental thing. Okay, camera modes. Well, how do camera modes affect shutter speed? Well, let me tell you. In manual mode, you select the shutter speed. That's it. Doesn't matter what the camera meter says. It, you select the settings that you want including the shutter speed. In semi-automatic modes, well, there's two main ones, aperture priority mode. In aperture priority mode, you select the aperture and the camera selects the shutter speed to give you the correct exposure according to the camera for the ISO that you've already selected. In shutter priority mode, you select the shutter speed, you select the shutter speed even, and the camera selects the aperture to give the correct exposure according to the camera for the ISO that you have already set. And then there are fully automatic modes where the camera selects the aperture and the shutter speed and sometimes the ISO, all depending on the subject matter that you tell it you're photographing. This is like the same things like landscape, portrait and what have you. 
Okay, so what, what does this really mean? I mean, this means that by selecting the shutter speed, you can photograph a wide range of subjects correctly. And this is the point. You can use these shutter speed settings as intended or creatively. So let me give you a few examples. So for fast moving stuff, you'd, you'd want a faster shutter speed, wouldn't you? Say one one thousandth to one four thousandth of a second. And for normal day to day stuff, a fast enough shutter speed would be what? One hundred twenty fifth of a second to one five hundredth of a second. Alternatively, to get blur in a waterfall, you could go two to ten seconds. Shooting in low light, a lower shutter speed, half, quarter, eighth of a second. And for bright light, a faster shutter speed, something like one one thousandth of a second. Handheld, fast enough. Faster than the, repi- <laughs> the reciprocal of the focal length. These are obviously just a guide to the kinds of shutter s- speeds that you might use. Just, just to give you examples in case you don't know. Okay, so exposure. Well, we have to remember that every time we change the shutter speed, we are changing the amount of light that gets through to the camera sensor. And this changes the exposure, which is why we also have the aperture and the ISO, which we change in conjunction with the shutter speed to get the correct exposure. One of those strange Google questions now. Is there a best shutter speed? No, there is not. It just depends on so many things. But you do need to make sure whatever shutter speed you use that the photos you take are sharp and there is no blur. Okay, I think I think that's me done there. <laughs> I enjoyed that one, just explaining stuff that makes sense. It's a refreshing change, even though I made a little bit of a mess with some of it. So talk a bit over, what if I use a phone and not a camera? Well, I've got an iPhone XS. Yep, still got that old phone. Go on the internet and it tells you how to change the shutter speed, but when I tried to do this, it didn't work. The thing that was described when you touched the other thing, it wasn't there, so I felt somewhat cheated. And then I thought, well, there must be an app that does this. And then then I remembered that thing called um, Lightroom Mobile. And yes, you can change the shutter speed using the camera in Lightroom Mobile. Completely forgotten about that and how good an app it is on my camera. On my phone, even. (laughs) And that's something else I've learned from this episode, which I had no idea. It's just a slidey thing. You could change the shutter speed and it just makes it brighter or darker. And obviously there's more to it than that. But I didn't know I could do that. Lightroom Mobile for um, iPhone and for Android, actually. It's free as well, and it's a brilliant camera. You can shoot in RAW in it as well. Sorry, advert over. But to be honest, I'm not that bothered about this. That's why I've got a camera after all, isn't it? Okay, so what if I use a film camera? Well, everything I've said so far applies. I mean, yeah, <laughs> apart from the phone bit. And and I remember to not write and then say all the above, because that's what I've said before is, what if I use a film camera? All of the above applies, but that doesn't really make sense in a podcast, does it? No, not a lot more to this. Move on, Rick. Okay, so what do I do? Well, I use AV mode for most photos that I take. My camera is normally on a tripod, so shutter speed. It's not really a concern to me, and I'm photographing buildings most of the time, and and they don't move. Well, you'd hope not. I've already selected the ISO, which is the lowest ISO that I can, which is 100. And then I select the aperture and the camera picks the shutter speed to give me the correct exposure. And when I'm shooting handheld, I still use AV mode. I think, I don't know, I just got stuck in AV mode. I mean, AV mode, nothing wrong with that. It's just what I prefer to use. And I just select an ISO that will give me a fast enough shutter speed to get sharp photos. And that's it, really. So I do this for my architectural photography, travel photography, landscape photography, well, anything, really. Quite boring, aren't I? I tend to work the same way, whatever I'm photographing. But it works for me. But when I want a super long shutter speed, I use my 10-stop neutral density filter to massively reduce the amount of light getting through to my camera sensor. And it's massive. And we're talking here, you can be using a 15-second exposure in daylight. It's madness. And it really can do different things. Now, it does bring other, it's other other complications with it, but it's brilliant. I absolutely love it. So I'd, I'd recommend neutral density filters if you never tried them. OK, moving on, some thoughts from the last episode, which was episode 155. What is aperture in photography? Well, do you know what I forgot to say? <laughs> this This rather fundamental thing. I forgot to say that the aperture in a camera lens is an adjustable thing, made up of blades, made of metal or other material, that closes the opening in the camera lens as the aperture is stopped down. 
as a larger aperture value is selected. It's a device with blades, probably made of metal, and when you stop down, the blades close in, and at minimum aperture, it's a tiny opening in the camera lens. And probably should have said that last last episode, but there you go, I've done it now. Yeah, just to, just to be clear, the aperture is not the size of the opening in the camera lens. The aperture is a device within the lens that can reduce the size of the opening from maximum aperture. Right, I think I've covered that one now. Lovely. Okay, next episode. Well, episode 157. After aperture and shutter speed, I have to cover ISO. I haven't got a title yet for this episode, but I'm going to try and come up with something interesting. Yeah, good luck with that, Rick. Then again, I'm talking about ISO, so <laughs> but I can't I can't think of a reason to not do it, although I am trying. No, I need to do this, but this one might be a quick episode because there's only so much you can say about ISO, and I'm not going to pad it out with examples just to make it last longer. The aim is I'm going to explain it quickly and as as unboringly as I can, if unboring is a word. Okay, then why don't you ask me a question? Well. If you've got a question you'd like me to answer, just head over to the podcast website, photographyexplainedpodcast.com forward slash start, where you can find out what to do. And you could also just get in touch and say hi. Great to hear from you. And it's great that I'm hearing lots more from listeners these days. It's really good and I really enjoy it. Okay, that's all. Well, this episode was brought to you by, um, well, for a change, a cheese and pickle sandwich and shock horror. No crisps. No, I'm on a crisp-free, um, well, diet, I guess. <laughs> uh, washed down with a nice cold diet Pepsi before I settled down in my homemade, acoustically cushioned, technologically sound recording emporium. Today's acoustic treatment is one pillow and two hoodies. In my script, I've written four pillows and two fleeces. <laughs> I forgot that. I've got one one pillow and two hoodies. Seems to be working fine. Right, okay, I'm going to stop there. I've been Rick McAvoy. Thanks again very much for listening to my small but perfectly formed podcast, it says here, and for giving me 27-ish minutes of your valuable time. Well, I think this one will be about 26, 27 minutes after I've edited out the mistakes and the other bad stuff, as this was relatively straightforward to explain, it says here. Might not sound like that. Okay, I'm done. Thanks again for listening. Take care. Stay safe. Cheers from me, Rick. And there you go, we're done. 35 minutes. I thought this was going to be a quick episode, but clearly it isn't. So, oh.